famous theologian of the last century was lecturing at seminary one day and the prof uh, students came up to him during the lecture and said, you know, you've written so many books on the theology of the New Testament. If you were to try to summarize everything that you've written and everything that you know about God's great and wonderful love, what would you say in one sentence? If you could put it into one sentence. Zach, he simply said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That summarizes everything. The wonderful, wonderful love of Jesus. This morning for the text is found in Mark's Gospel in chapter 4, beginning with verse 35. If the words are on the screen or if you'd like to follow me in the scripture, Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 35. On that day, when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died, died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? May God bless the reading of his word for our hearing and consideration. It's a story that's so familiar to most all of us in this room today. This nature miracle, this miracle of the calming of a tumultuous sea and strong and mighty winds. Jesus had been teaching on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And on this eastern side of the sea, uh, there are tall mountains with great valleys in between and it's not uncommon for the wind to come roaring through those valleys and then across the sea. So a storm could whip up about any time but they were not always as fierce perhaps as this storm on this day. Uh, Jesus had been teaching uh, in parables to the folks on the eastern side. He taught them about the lamp he taught them about the growing seed. He taught them about the mustard seed. All of these dealing with the kingdom of God and how it was to be understood and what it was all about. And after a long day of teaching, even Jesus could get tired. Emotionally drained. All of the dealings with the people trying to help them understand God's love for their lives and what the kingdom of God was and how it was for them. Perhaps he was out in that little boat, a little distance from the shore as the people gathered on the beach to hear him teach. And when the day was concluded... The disciples simply took him as he was, already in that boat, and began to sail to the western side of the Sea of Galilee. The western side that was more populous, new villages, more people to, to share the gospel with, more opportunities to proclaim God's love to a, to a lost people who wanted so much to understand the love of God for their lives. And as that boat and other boats, Mark says, began to go over to the western side, a great storm came. 
Now understand, I don't know how many of those disciples were in that boat with Jesus. There were other boats. Maybe there were too many to put in one boat, or maybe some of the folks from the beach began to get their boats out into the water. But let's suppose that there were 12 disciples and Jesus in that boat. Pretty full boat. Most of those disciples were fishermen. They knew how to deal with wind and waves on that sea. They'd been there before. They'd done that. In our vocabulary, we could say, did, uh, been there, done that, got the t-shirt to prove it. They knew how to handle storms. Oh, but this storm that came upon them that night. What a storm. Almost like some of these straight line winds that come uh, in our area that blow the shingles off of roofs and trees down on cars. A gale like hurricane type wind blowing across that sea. And even those fishermen who knew how to handle a boat were afraid for their lives. The winds strong. The waves were beginning to leap into the boat so that the boat was about to capsize. And these fellas understood how to deal with the boat in high waves and strong winds, but they could not handle this, not at all. They were afraid their little boat was going to capsize and go down. And they were all going to die. I don't know which one of them or if all of them may be remembered Hey, Jesus is here. Maybe we need to find Jesus and ask him to do something. Scripture says he's sound asleep. Let me tell you, he was in a dead sleep. He wasn't in a light sleep like you and I might have and, and somebody knock on the door and we, we get up because we're in a, such a light sleep. We're in one of those dead sleeps like when the alarm clock goes off and rings for 30 minutes and you don't hear it. He was in a dead sleep. And they went back there and, and tried to rouse him and, and wake him up. Master, master, teacher, don't you care? <laughs> We're going to perish, man. Don't you care? You notice what Jesus says? He simply gets up. In the words of the King James, is peace, be still. Hush! That's the way of saying it. Stop all this noise. Be calm. Be calm. And it wasn't 30 minutes later. It was an instantaneous miracle. The winds that had been rocking that boat and drawing those waves ceased. And the waves calm. Just like a little lake. Calm and peaceful. Did you notice when Jesus said, where's your faith? They became very much afraid. Maybe more afraid of Jesus than they were of the wind and the waves. Because being aware that Jesus is there and Jesus has the authority and the power to do only that which the Creator could do, calm an angry storm they became aware, perhaps, of their own sinfulness in the presence of a holy God. They were afraid. Not just a little afraid, a lot afraid. One theologian, I think it was John MacArthur, that I read this week said, the only thing more fearful than the storm outside the boat is having God in the boat. Because all of a sudden it makes us aware of ourselves and who we are and the trouble in our lives and our own lack of faith in the presence of a God who created us. Oh, what manner of man is this? Who is this? That even the wind and the waves should obey His voice. Who is this? Let me tell you who it is. It's Jesus. It's the Christ. It's the Messiah. It's the Son of David. It's the Rose of Sharon. It's the Lion of Judah. Who is this? This is Jesus, the one who could make a miracle of feeding 5,000 people with just a handful of food. This is Jesus, 
who could make the lame walk and, and the blind see and the deaf hear. This is Jesus who could make the sick well and the dead come to life again. This is Jesus. And he's in the boat. And he's there to calm a storm. Now, the scripture is more than just a story that took place a long time ago, 2,100 years ago, roughly. It's a story about us. It's a story about your life and my life individually and our lives collectively as a church family. It's a story about us and the, and the troubles that we sometimes face in life and the storms that seem to be so, so strong, the winds that seem to just push us, push us, push us and keep us from ever getting where we need to be or waves that seem to capsize our little boat and make us wonder if we're ever going to survive the trouble that we're in. It's about us. It's about those storms of illnesses. It's about those storms of financial woes. It's those storms about families being torn apart. It's those storms about jobs that just seem to go away. It's about all kinds of troubles and heartaches that you and I face every day in our own individual lives. And we, like those disciples, often try to manage things on our own. Don't we? I read somewhere where someone said, when you're trying to put something together, you ever tried putting together a swing set? That seems to be written in Japanese instructions. I don't know. Men, you may have the same problem I do. I hate following directions. I just try to get in there and do it. And when I discover that when I get in there and do it, I have to undo it about three times to get it right and finally go back and read directions. When all else fails, read the directions. And, and what... Mark is saying, is these men trying to, to get that boat to safety? They tried to bail the water out. They tried individually to use their own intellect and their own strength to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish, to bring about their own safety, to make it happen in their lives. But they just couldn't do it. They may have even all grouped together. Maybe they said, you do... Bell over here and I'll bell over there. But even collectively, they couldn't do it in their own strength. They could not bring about a calming of that sea any more than you and I in our own strength trying to figure out how to deal with the problems you and I face in life and handle them on our own will ever be able to handle them. We can't do it in our own strength. As a church family, we realize we're all in the same boat. We're all in this New Bethel boat. And this boat faces storms. It has faced some storms. I'm not telling you something you don't know. We have faced the storm. And sometime in the midst of those storms, we begin to try to bail water. Or we begin to bring down the sail because we don't want it to tip us over. Or maybe we begin to try to put up barriers to force the wind away. But when we try to salvage the ship of Zion on our own, in our own strength, by our own intellect, we are fighting a losing battle and we are sure to sink. I want you to understand that in this ship, just like in our lives, there is one in the boat with us all the time. We're just not aware of it sometimes. We get so busy trying to do things on our own that we forget about Jesus. He's here. He's always been here. He has said to us, And lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age or the end of the world, I am here with you. And who is the one that's here with us? The one who created the winds and the waves. The one who John said 
Without him was not anything made that was made. Who is this Jesus? He is the one to whom we must turn to set a straight and a right the old ship of Zion. He is the one to whom we must turn if our lives are ever going to be what they need to be individually and if the church is ever going to be what God has called it to be. We turn to Jesus. And I don't know about you, sometimes it's a frightful thing to realize you're standing next to Jesus and He's with you. Because when you realize you're in the presence of Jesus, just like Isaiah in the presence of God in Isaiah chapter 6, said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And Isaiah realized his own sinfulness in the presence of a holy God. He could not redeem himself, but God would do that for him. And when we realize that we are in the presence of a holy Jesus who controls all things, if we allow him to do that, who can clear up the mess that we find ourselves in in our individual lives, if we allow him to do that, who can set a straight and a right the ship of Zion, the New Bethel ship, if we allow him to do that, when we understand we are in the presence of the one who knows our hearts and knows our minds and knows what we're planning to do, that's when we need to stop and say, Lord, take away my plans and give me your plans. Take away my way of dealing with things and let me use your way of dealing with things. Let me trust you. Let me surrender myself fully to you. Let me let you allow you to make me holy and righteous in your sight by my total surrender of who I am and my plans and my will and my way and all that I own. May I give it to you, to you totally to you, when these men in the boat realized they couldn't do it anymore and they gave it to Jesus, that's when things began to go right for them. And I say to you, my friends here at New Bethel, it's when we turn loose of ourselves and we determine in our own minds and our own hearts to give it all to Jesus, to trust Him, to take care of the past and move us forward into the present. This is a new beginning for New Bethel Baptist Church. The past is gone. We're not trying to go back to the past. We're trying to move forward to the future. And we look forward to the future and we look forward to what Jesus is leading us to accomplish and to do. And we're saying, Lord, we're going to stay focused on you. Lord, don't let me look at myself. Let me look at you. Let me follow you. I'm not an old farmer, but I did plant a garden once or twice. My wife would laugh at me when I did that. I was in my 20s at the time. You ever tried to plow in a white shirt and tie? Kind of stupid, isn't it? <laughs> but look, I realized when I got behind that plow, if I start looking back here, I'm going all over the place. But if I look to where I need to go, I'm going to go right straight to where I need to be. And Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. He says to us, we look forward. Paul says, forgetting what is behind, I'm pressing forward for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's going forward. The past is gone, my brothers and sisters. We're not trying to reclaim a past. We're trying to go forward and claim a future. A future that God has for us in this place called New Bethel. And what he needs from us is our willingness 
to stop trying to bail water on our own and give it to him. Let him be the one who can say, peace, be still. Muzzle it. Hush. He would say to those, things, those winds that would try to blow us away. Hush. Be still. The scripture says of the Lord when he says be still and know that I am God. I am God. He is God. And he's in the boat. That's up to us. Do we keep bailing? Keep rowing? Keep trying on our own? Or do we surrender it all to Jesus and let him do what he wants to do in our lives and in this place? Oh, my friends, the decision is always left up to God's people. Those disciples could have left Jesus alone and kept bailing. Don't know what would have happened. I doubt that they would have sunk to the bottom because Jesus was there. They just weren't aware of it when they needed it. I'm saying to you, Jesus is here. And we're all in the same boat. Will you let him guide the boat to safety? Will you let him take the boat forward to where it needs to be? Will you forget about the eastern side and go towards the west to where the people are, to where the safety is? Will you allow him to work in your life and in your heart today? Without him, we can't manage. Without him, the boat's going nowhere. But with him, old ship of Zion is going to move forward and the kingdom of God is going to be so real within your life and within mine that we're going to experience the difference yes it's a fearful thing to stand in the presence of a holy God until you realize that holy God in the person of Jesus has redeemed you from your sin and made you righteous in the sight of the Father. And that holy Jesus, who was with you always, is the one who says, I will keep the st storm calm. I will keep the seas peaceful. And the waves, the winds away. I will control this ship when you gave it to me to control. Will you give Jesus control of your life today? People of New Bethel, will you give Jesus control of this church today? Will you allow him to calm whatever seas need to be calmed and whatever winds need to be ceased and let him guide you and me together in the direction he wants us to go as his body we're in it together. Can't do it. Fighting against one another. We're in it together. We can't even do it working together in our own strength. Just trying to figure out what way we need to do. Go. We can only do it when we give it to Jesus. And we decide today in this place, this is the Lord's boat. And we're in it with him. And he is going to be the captain. And he's going to guide this old ship to where it needs to be. What decision will you make this morning? For this is a time for us to decide. Individually and collectively. What am I going to do with Jesus? And what I'm, am I going to allow Jesus to do with me? If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, 
My friend, you need to do that, and you don't need to walk out of these doors today without doing it. Stay in a boat with him where he can redeem you from your sin and set you free and give you peace and calm within your soul. It's a simple fact, a simple move, a simple faith. If you give your life to Jesus. If you're here today and you are a member of New Bethel, or you are a member of another church somewhere else, but this is where you've been worshiping and serving Him, the invitation that Jesus gives to you today is to make it certain in your heart and in your life that you're going to stay in the boat with Jesus and He's going to captain this boat and you're going to seek His will for your life. And in the time of invitation, I'm going to ask you to step from the pew where you are and come down to the front of this church at this altar as a way of saying publicly, I'm in the boat and I'm with Jesus. And he's going to guide my ship. You may be here and your membership may be somewhere else, but this is where God wants you to have your membership so you can be a full part of what's taking place and will take place as we move forward with Jesus. Then I invite you to come and make this your church home by letter, by statement, by whatever means this church receives members. This is the Lord's invitation and it is our time to respond to that invitation. It's not the preacher's invitation. It is the Lord's invitation. And in his name, I invite you to make your decision public for him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, sometimes it's beyond words <coughs> to express our own feelings, our own desires. It's beyond words to be able to even comprehend and explain who you are or what you want to do in our lives. But, oh God, we know that one thing you want to do, and that is you want to bring us into fellowship with you. You created us in the beginning for fellowship with you. From the Garden of Eden on, it's been fellowship with you. That's your desire. You gave Abraham a promise that from his descendants you would bless the earth and indeed Jesus in that line of Abraham has blessed the earth with his presence. Jesus who is the son of God has redeemed us from our sins. Jesus the one who has authority over the wind and the waves can calm our storms, remove us from troubled seas and set us a sail on smooth water. Oh God, if there's anyone here this morning, anyone at all, who needs to make that decision, to allow you to be captain of the boat, the master of their lives, who want to say to you and to the congregation, I'm in the boat, but Lord, I'm going to follow you as you take the ship where you want it to go. I pray, Lord, that those might come in rededication of heart and life to your leadership in their lives and in the life of this church. For others who may want to just be a part of this church family, officially and fully, I pray that they might come. This is your call. You're watching us, Lord, even as you call. You're asking us not to, to turn a deaf ear, but to hear and to respond. And 
So, Lord, in these moments as we close, help us to do exactly what you want us to do. in this place and in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray.